Welcome to Hunt the Land podcast, centered on bow hunting, habitat management, and all things deer. Now here are your hosts, Mark Turner and Mariah Bogus. Hey guys, I'm Mark. And I'm Mariah. This is episode 14 of Hunt the Land podcast. Today we're going to be talking about one of the easiest ways to improve the food and cover on your property for deer, and that is going in and killing out your non-native cool season grasses. But first, we're going to talk a little bit of deer hunting. Welcome to the show, everybody. Today, we are going to take on a super important topic, and that is uh, conversion of cool season grass fields um, in any areas that cool season grasses are invading and actually um, converting those into native plant communities for uh, wildlife management. So I think we'll probably focus a lot on deer and uh, probably talk quail and and turkey as well. Um, But... Real important, fun stuff, you know, from a hunting standpoint, but uh, we're going to talk habitat management before that. It is deer season in Mississippi, and uh, so I've got some updates I want to tell you about, Mark, but I think first, uh, I'd like to know what you're doing now with just a little bit less than a week before deer season. How does it feel? Well, it feels slightly better knowing that with this hurricane coming through, which is... um. First off, obviously, and on a serious note, like thinking about everybody with this hurricane coming in, but I don't know if you've seen all the memes with uh, with this hurricane, because it's Hurricane Michael, and there's a lot of mm-hmm. memes with like Michael Scott from The Office, like in the eye of the hurricane, and I don't know. Oh. There's just all sorts <laughs> no, of... I, I... <laughs> Yeah, and it reminds me a couple of years ago that one of those winter storms was Winter Storm Toby, and there was a bunch that were oh, like of course, had Toby. Toby in it, <laughs> and so and so there's a lot of that going on. But um, no, this hurricane coming in though, the opener's on Monday in Alabama, and it's looking like the weather is going to be pretty sweet. I think we're going to see a pretty big temperature drop. Over the weekend, the storm's going to hit Wednesday and Thursday, but over the weekend, the temperature's going to be falling pretty steadily, and I think the temperature next week's going to be pretty low, so, uh, I mean, I was seeing reports, again, around Auburn, but I was seeing some reports at one point that next Monday, we're going to have lows in the, like, 49-ish, so, Mm. pretty pretty decent temperature drop there, so... Yeah, at the very least, I don't think highs are going to get outside of the 70s during next week. It didn't look like it, at least for the earlier part of the week. So it's kind of exciting stuff with the season coming up. So I'm looking forward to that. Just yeah, need to get out and shoot my bow a couple more times, and then I'll be ready to rock and roll, I think. Hopefully. Man. <laughs> yeah. So what uh what are you looking for? I mean, you know, early in the season, will uh will a doe do, or are you you holding out for a buck, or what's the deal over there? So a doe would do, but in my part of and the areas that I hunt predominantly, I'm not going to be able to shoot a doe until October. I think it's like the 25th, or it's the it's whatever the. I guess the second Saturday of the season is. If I, I believe that's right. I, I need to look at the regulation book. I mean, obviously, I'll do that before I shoot anything. But there's about a there's about a week and a half, two weeks at the start of the season where you cannot shoot does. So I need to look at that. But there are some areas. There's one place that's like 45 minutes to an hour away that I could shoot a doe at. And I've never checked it out before. But honestly, and it's not very big and it's not very good from everything I've heard of it. But I was thinking through it, and I was like, well, you know, my odds of encountering a doe there are probably a little better than my odds of encountering a buck, right now at least, Yeah. on the main WMAs that I hunt. Yeah. So, realistically, you know, I might be, I might be better off giving that a shot. So we'll see. Um, obviously, I wish I'd scouted it out beforehand, but I didn't really realize that that 
particular county was outside of this zone where you can't shoot does that early. So, mm. yeah. We'll uh we'll see which is kind of funny because you know there's places in North Alabama where the breeding takes place predominantly in January and February too. And I mean that's the reason why right. they do it is because the fawns are being born, but you know realistically is you know a, a few a few weeks is probably not making much of a difference but i'm sure it's i'm sure it's just a traditional thing i mean it's not it's not a big deal but i know on your side uh you you obviously decided that a doe was good enough for you the other night yeah yeah so uh i got a couple hunts i want to talk about and i i'll just try to make them as brief as possible but um, I had some kind of learning experiences <clears throat> and then leading up to a successful hunt. And so I want to talk about those first. So um, on this one particular piece of property this past weekend, I decided to do a morning hunt. And I went into this little marsh and there's persimmons everywhere. And, uh, you know, I worked in there an hour and a half before uh, legal shooting light. And uh, so it was pitch dark using the headlamp saw some deer you know, just worked past them they didn't really react until i got to that persimmon tree and then there was a deer there that i ended up spooking i kind of walked right up on it and uh you know was, i was walking along and I, you know as i was getting into marsh i was looking at all the persimmons on the trees and trying to find a spot because on this edge you know it's really hard to, to actually get up in a tree um being that it's an edge and that all the small little willows and persimmons but Anyway, I got walking along and found this big persimmon tree dropping. And as you know, about that time that I realized what was going on, I looked down at my feet and the ground was all trampled and there was deer droppings everywhere. And I was like, okay, great. You know, like I was pretty much standing where <laughs> the deer were going to hopefully come. <laughs> and uh, I tried to find a, a spot to get up in a tree so I could look out over the marsh where I. Uh, across the marsh where I thought the deer would eventually bed and then also be able to shoot um, this persimmon tree and I tried and tried and couldn't find a tree and ended up having to kind of work back the way I came come um, down the edge of the marsh and I ended up setting up about 40 yards from this tree but I couldn't shoot it at all because of the edge got up in this little black willow like six or seven feet off the ground I was like one and a half um, lone wolf sticks up in this tree but it was as high as I could get and still have like a decent sh shot out into the marsh and I could also shoot this little strip of woods between the marsh I was in and the next like little pond over it was actually a little dried up pond over so anyway uh, that morning I had a doe actually had two does and a buck pop out in that little dried up pond across the strip of woods from me and the buck was probably a little two-year-old uh he had this really wild it's actually pretty cool he he was just inside his ears like a big four point and then he had this crazy dagger like sticker off the base of his left um antler and it was probably like a four inch long at least sticker that kind of angled up right up in front of his eye um just real wild looking but pretty cool he walked right under me six or seven steps from my stand and that was the first doe or first deer i could have shot this year and the does came behind them but they were about 25 yards away and they were in the brush and they eventually got over to the pers persimmon tree and i think they would have worked out into the open in the marsh where i could have shot but they picked up my ground scent and just were weary they they fed under there for probably 10 or 15 minutes and then eventually kind of got spooky and um went down you know worked down the edge of the marsh so in that case, you know, if I hadn't walked over to that persimmon earlier, uh, of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. but if I hadn't walked over there, there's a pretty good chance I might have been able to shoot one of those does. And uh, so anyway, yeah, so that's, that's what happened um, that morning. Uh, the next day or so, I ended up going back to that same property, and uh, I was going to hunt anywhere along the perimeter of that property. I basically just kind of put the wind in my face and ended up walking along a bunch of marsh. And I got to the spot that is kind of a pinch. It's kind of a funnel in between several marshes. And right about that time, all of a sudden, there was a 
couple big rubs, like real tall rubs right there, just super fresh. And I was like, huh, you know? And I started, I kept working down the line because it was, I thought they were coming from the direction I was going. But after I stood, you know, I stopped and was thinking about it for a minute. All of a sudden I had two deer jump up within like 30 yards of me that had been watching me the whole time. And uh, the one that I saw wasn't a big buck, but the other one, you know, <laughs> leave it to the imagination. I I'm not exactly sure what it was. But uh, yeah, it was pretty big rubs there. So anyway, I went, worked on down the line, and I ended up getting to where I wanted to go, and, you know, and the moral of, of this story is to kind of trust your your, your prior scouting. Um, I flagged the spot as having a bunch of loaded persimmon trees, and it's this little, it's basically a, a really big, broad point that kind of angles down into a couple of oxbows, and right there in the point between the oxbows, um, it's almost like this little island of um, of willows, and up kind of higher up the point, more on the mainland is where all these persimmons were, and that's where I was working toward. And when I got there, I couldn't like I was having the hard, hardest time f finding the persimmon trees. I don't know what it was. I knew they were there because they were marked on my map, but I was having the hardest time finding them. And finally, I started to see a couple, but the ones I was seeing didn't have any persimmons in them. And so I kept walking further and further onto that point, and then all of a sudden, I jumped three or four really big deer. Um, one of them looked like a really big buck and, uh, they took off through the oxbow. I mean, making the, uh, it's so loud. It sounded like a horse, you know, swimming through water. They shot across that oxbow. They probably had to swim a little bit to actually get across it. It was pretty crazy what they went through to get away from me. Um, so long story short, I found where they were bedded, but, uh, yeah, uh, I, again, I messed, I messed up. Uh, so hindsight's twenty twenty. Moved on down the line, ended up finding a trail camera, um, and I hunted down that way uh, under an oak tree that was dropping. I just had a couple fawns come out later that night. But anyway, that was uh, those were my hunts leading up to the successful one. And so what I was taking away from it was that I needed to be where either the persimmons were dropping or there was oaks dropping. Um, and I needed to be where the fresh sign was, not necessarily where I had scouted prior that, uh, you know, could have dried up, um, since I had scouted. It's almost like you could have listened to a podcast that was put out like a week ago on that very topic. <laughs> well, so the reason, you know, the reason as, as soon as the season started, I had all these ideas of spot. Well, there's one particular spot I really want to get back to. Because when I was there two months ago, there was deer all over it and some really big bucks. Well, I went and I sat that stand on like Saturday evening or something. And I just sat at observation sit over so I could see the whole marsh. And it was a waste of an evening. The deer were, com I mean, completely gone. I really didn't see any sign going in. It had dried up and it had, you know, everything had changed in two months. Which, I mean, I, no, no big surprise there. But like... So yeah, I kind of cemented in my mind. I'm like, okay, I need to be mobile. I need to just put the wind in my face and then walk until I see the first sign that it's a good spot and then set up immediately. Because, I, you know, I was jumping deer by by seeing, oh, this is, and, and you've probably been here before, but you're walking around and you're like, oh, this looks good. And then you're like, I wonder if it gets better. Or I wonder if this is good yep. enough to set up on. And I struggle with that every single time. So now I want to talk about a successful hunt. So the next day, um, and, and not that that wasn't, I, I really enjoyed jumping those bucks as frustrating as it was because now I'm putting a get together a game plan. Uh, probably in a month or more, I'll probably go back to that spot once it's cooled down and no one's been in there for a while and hopefully uh, put a put a move on that. But so... Uh, Anyway, Sunday evening, I was able to get out real early, you know, earlier than I usually or have been able to. I was in the woods by like two, one thirty or 2 o'clock and uh, started working down the edge of this marsh, you know, wind in my face, hit this. Well, well first I found a really nice shed, which is pretty, pretty sweet. And uh, it's from last year. Went about another hundred yards further and hit this little oxbow and there was persimmons all up and down it. And of course, if you listen to our 
podcast last week or know anything about persimmons there's male and female trees and what i was finding was a lot of male trees i, I wasn't seeing any persimmons so I, at first i kind of walked um downwind and looked at all those persimmon trees and not didn't see any persimmons and then i ended up crossing the oxbow which i shouldn't have done and walking you know um let's see wait is this a is this an oxbow or an oxbow lake it's a little it's a little oxbow that it's kind of ephemeral. Um, right now, it is deep in section. It might have a foot or two of water, but there's like I found a spot I could hop across it. But earlier this summer, it was probably three feet deep. So it's is it cut off from the river or is it part of the? It is. It's it's well, yeah, yeah. I guess it it, it is kind of a lake. It is cut off from the river. It, but okay, but gotcha. the river. Yeah, backs I just want to make sure. It. The river. Okay, can so that back sounds similar. It. That sounds similar to the spot that I shot my first doe on public land in Alabama um, last okay. year, yeah. which that spot also has a lot of persimmons on it, which kind of goes back to when we were talking about, you know, they're some of the time when they're around spots with a bunch of moisture. But anyway, mm-hmm. go ahead. Yeah, so I had, uh, I crossed this little oxbow and I was working back up um, upwind. I was working upwind, so I was, I was walking with the wind in my face and then all of a sudden i found the tree you know <laughs> uh yeah. there was no doubt about it i i was like the whole you know the whole creek bottom and bank was just littered with tracks and unfortunately i was already on that side of the creek and this was actually not far from where i'd eventually where i first walked up against the oxbow on the other side but anyway uh right there there's this crossing because there's this big cypress tree right in the middle of the oxbow and i there's enough uh, organic matter and soil built up there that it makes it super shallow. And it's, it's actually just a mud crossing right now. And there was just deer tracks all across that little crossing, just soup. So I first cross, you know, across back across the, the oxbow so that I was, so that, uh, you know, so the downwind side of the oxbow and looking for a tree. I had my climber and uh, first I was looking at the sweet gum, but it had, poison ivy all over it and i really really weighed i really thought about it. i really weighed the risk because <laughs> i knew i would get it <laughs> if i climbed that tree but i was yep. like but <laughs> there was a, a persimmon tree actually right on the edge of the oxbow that was about six or seven inches in diameter and so i climbed up it and it got pretty skinny up there but it was the perfect view and uh, i got a new species of tree now mark so I got one more up on you on the species of tree I've killed a deer out of now <laughs> to, uh, to spoil the ending here. But, um, yeah, yep. so I got up in the persimmon about, I don't know, 3.30 or 3 or 3.30. And at 4.15, looked up the oxbow. Um, and, yeah, here comes a doe right down the other side. She came right to the persimmons on the other side, and I, I also need to add that the tree I was in is dropping persimmons, so she actually started to cross the creek, and I drew and shot her at about eight steps, and she was quartering toward me and ended up hitting her a little back. So that was 4.15. I ended up sitting the rest of the evening. About 20 minutes later, I, it was so cool. Like I looked up the oxbow right where I'd first seen that doe, and I saw there's a or cypress tree laying across the oxbow and i saw this coyote trot across it like the coolest thing ever and he went he was going across to the side she had originally come from and uh so anyway i kind of sque- squeaked at him a little bit and he went on his way and then about five or ten minutes later he here he comes you know right to the persimmon tree and i ended up shooting him and got my first coyote ever and uh so that was I mean, so many firsts on this hunt. First deer on public land, uh, first deer of the year, first Mississippi deer, first coyote ever, um, and the first, there's another first coming here. Uh, (laughs) So uh, that evening I had a a doe and some fawns come in later. Um, Anyway, I got down and I started looking for the doe at dark. And she had run under my stand and then behind me and kind of back the way I'd come in into this property and uh i i went probably 60 or 80 yards following blood but it was real dark and i was having a really hard time finding it and finally just quit 
and I was getting I was getting really worried um because I've been in this you know situation before and it just never seems to end well especially when you start grid searching and there was a little thicket that she had been running towards so I first started I headed in there I turned on the onyx map you know tracking where I'd walk so I would have an idea where I'd walked in this because it's dark and there's absolutely no landmarks uh, and then eventually what I ended up doing is I walked along the edge of the bigger, like the, the river, and then there's little kind of dried up oxbows coming off of it. And I walked the edge of the river and then I turned up one of those oxbows that was dried and full of tall grass and walked right up on her and boom, there she was 20 yards. She, uh, she'd been out for a while. So I was so excited and, and like when, when, you know, when, you know the feeling like when you start grid searching for a deer, like your optimism just drops because oh, I don't know. Sure. I don't know how many times like I've started doing that. And that's usually the beginning of a, a really long night that doesn't usually end in a deer. So, I mean, I had yep. been praying about it. And like, as soon as I found, I was just praising the Lord. I was like, man, I, you know, I got this deer and the mosquitoes were so bad at that spot. And that's right when my thermosel died and I'm a mile back in oh, public geez. land. And I had already gone to the car once, like after I got out of the stand, I went back to the car, dropped off my stand, got my pack with the knives and like pack out gear and came back to get her. So I'd already walked the mile back and back. Uh, so two miles round trip once. And right when I found the deer, my phone rang and I was like, huh, like if someone's calling me at, you know, eight thirty, nine 9 o'clock at night, it must be important. I answered it and it was the park ranger. Um, because there's a local park nearby and they someone had seen my car parked out there and was worried about me which is super cool like that some you know like people are that thoughtful but um on a lot of these properties you have to put your information on the dash of your car which Uh i don't know how i feel about it but actually in this case it it's really nice because there's your name and phone number um i guess you can't really hunt stealthy like people know where you're hunting if you if you're people are going to know your spots but um it, it, I guess it's for safety reasons more than anything that they do it. Yeah. But was, uh, you so go this, ahead. was this a was this a state park then? Um. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Well, it's. I think it's. I think it's federal. Like I think it's Army Corps. It's an. It's an Army uh, okay, Corps of gotcha. Engineer Park. Um. But anyway, so yeah, he called me and he's like, "Yeah, everything all right?" He's like, and so I just told him, I was like, "Yeah, you know." And I just, I told him I just found my deer and I was gonna pack her out. And he was like, "Well, how's the road down there?" And I was like, "Oh, it's not bad." And he ended up driving his his personal truck. And I just want to give a shout out to this guy. He drove his personal truck down to about three hundred. 400 yards from where the deer died and i went over there and met him <laughs> and then he actually Dang. he he helped me drag her out um and he had you know he had just gotten off work like he didn't have to do it but he was just trying to help me out because i was like i said a mile back and i was gonna end up having to pack her out so uh me and him were dragging this deer out and we ended up like take I don't know, like, Miss, I'm still getting used to Mississippi and, like, the topography and everything, and there's these really light ridges that only be, a, you know, a foot or two, and somehow or another, we end up going in the wrong direction, like, 150 or 200 yards, like, the complete wrong direction, just made a big U, and right before we realized that, I was, we were pulling along, and I looked, I was with, you know, shining in front of me with my headlamp, and darn if that other side of that shed wasn't laying right on that little ridge and i dropped the deer's leg and i was like man there's a shed right there and i ran over and grabbed it i was like that's the other side so i found so that's the other first for the night i found a matching set um on public land and uh my first night shed (laughs) which is a milestone out there so yeah Yeah. so i i found the matching set hopefully Maybe catch up with that buck or see him at some time. That'd be a really cool story. So, anyway, yeah, yeah he. I... Go ahead. I was just gonna say I remember the the only shed I've ever found at night was when I was turkey hunting, and that was so bizarre. <laughs> just seeing like what, like what are the odds? <laughs> what are the odds that I walked up on this? This one really glowed with the headlamp, but besides that, yeah, like you can't see hardly as much. So the, it was well, mine I wild. stepped on. I didn't have a light on. <laughs> shed stomper, I stepped man. On it. You're a shed. It was stomper. like a. It was like a. 
you know, a one or two year old shed, you know, it had been out there for a while and I just stepped on it and it like happened to catch my attention that it didn't feel like a stick. And I looked down, I was like, what the heck? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, that was pretty, pretty sweet night. (laughs) Yeah. Now let me ask you this. Do you think like given the, that oxbow that I hunt, I'm just thinking about, um, do you think that they are coming just to the persimmon or is there a bunch of like green vegetation growing up in the oxbow too, that they'd be coming to in this particular one? It was, uh, just the persimmons because, okay. There really wasn't much, um, there really wasn't much as far as vegetation. It's still like while the water's down, it's what it is either like cypress and then right on the edge, there's some persimmons mix. And then it's either just mud or water. Um, it hasn't, it hasn't been down long enough for really anything to grow there. I got you. But it's, I got you. it's definitely something I'll do in the future, especially like if it's a piece of property I haven't been able to scout, you know, at least for the first week or two of season. If you, if you can target an area where you think persimmons will be, and, you know, in this case it worked perfect because you just find the persimmons and end up just walking until you find the tree. And usually there'll be a tree that, you know, or a cluster of them that's dropping and it's, you know, pretty obvious. And it was in this case. So made my life easier for sure. And that's also my first deer on persimmons. I think we talked about that last week. I had never killed one over persimmons. And Mm -hmm. sure enough, first one. Yeah, maybe I can try to make a move. It's If I do, it's probably going to be a pretty good deer though because it'll be a buck because by the time that the... I can shoot a doe, the persimmons will be done, but you never yeah. know. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I just got back from hunting a couple minutes before we started recording and, uh, and I'm, I'll just tell this real quick because I've been really long winded, but I went into the spot and I was hoping that the swamp white oaks would be dropping because there was a couple in the spot and well, so okay, yeah. So there's a there's a, a peninsula that that uh, <clears throat> kind of off the mainland. It goes out in into uh, this lake. And on one side of the peninsula is kind of a slough, and on the other side is the lake. And the peninsula runs north to south, and then it kind of cur- hooks around, uh, like hooks down to the west. So it comes from the north, and then it hooks down to the west. So I was sitting up, you know, in the top of the peninsula. Um, and I was hoping that the deer would be bedded down in the bottom of it where it kind of hooks up again to the west because we had a, a southeast wind. So basically it would be bro- blowing right at the back of the smallest part of the peninsula, um, kind of out on the point of it. And uh, so anyway, it's about a mile or maybe a little bit farther walk in there. Got to my spot, didn't get set up till like 4.30 or 4.45 and within like 15 minutes, I had three does and two fawns work from the mainland and actually work their way out onto the peninsula. And I knew there was white oaks out there because I had scouted it before. And all the the swamp chestnuts are right where I was sitting, but the white oaks are out on the point. And I was like, oh, great. Like, the oaks are out there. If there's any deer bedded out there, there's no reason for them to come past me, you know. So I was, you know, happy at least about seeing deer, but... Actually, about 15 minutes later, you know, I, I was super excited because the plan worked out. Here comes a buck um, right off that peninsula. He'd been bedded out there, and he came right from where the does had just gone, and uh, I had him at about 25 yards and could have shot him. Um, probably a little two-year-old, possibly a yearling, but he had a pretty good, like, I never saw his body very well, um, but his antlers look like a two year old at least uh, just going off that without, you know, being able to see the body. So, and then I had a, I had a doe and fawn come in um, at six o'clock right at 15 yards. Perfect shot to my left. And I let her go, Mark. I don't, (laughs) this, like I never pass does. And then we've talked about, I never pass does. And on public land, like I feel, I already feel a little crazy having done it. But I still have a whole deer sitting in the cooler here that I need to process um, this coming weekend. And then I'm headed to my study site tomorrow until Friday. And then I'm going to be busy all weekend working on um, my research project. So 
and then we also need to record tonight and like i just have so much going on that i kind of thought you know i'll let them let them have one this time and just didn't really have the time to invest in uh, processing another deer so she'll live uh live to fight another day but i mean i i can't complain the last two times i've been hunting i've had deer in range and today i had eight different deer in bow range so i can't wait uh till you get out there i start hearing stories from you too yeah hopefully it's hopefully you know last year i had a i had a tough time at the start of the season uh i killed that one at the i think it was like halloween or the 30th of october or something like that and but I had a pretty tough time starting the season out last year, so hopefully uh, this year is a little bit, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more action early season, kind of like what you're having. So we'll see. Yeah, I mean, and and for anyone else out there listening, just to kind of give you an idea, like tonight, the deer that I saw were, I mean, they were hammering um, water oaks, actually. Um, the does as they were coming in they hung out underneath a water oak tree for a while and then they finally moseyed on out to that peninsula and and there may be white oaks out there i don't really know but uh when i saw them they were you know they were chowing down on water oaks now the doe and fauna had come in later they were coming into the swamp chestnut that i was sitting over and from the looks of it that tree i don't know if it aborted its acorns or what but it seems like they're pretty much all gone already. And the ground underneath it was tore up pretty well, which it seems pretty early to have already dropped. So I'm not exactly sure uh, with that. But, you know, on this property, there are some persimmons. I walked past persimmons on the way in, and I almost sat them because there was sign under them. But I really wanted to get back to that peninsula because I was hoping bucks would be bedded on it. So I didn't stop at the persimmons. But on the way out, there was deer underneath the persimmon trees um that i saw on my way out so yeah i mean if you're hunting over the next week or so definitely if you can find persimmons you want to sit on them and uh the oaks you know saw eight deer eight deer tonight on the oaks so uh that's not too shabby either no certainly not certainly no. not but i guess kind of transitioning though today um, with the rest of the podcast and our podcast topic is actually not going to be hunting centered simply because this time of year is the perfect time of year to do one of my personal favorite habitat management projects. And that would be killing non-native grass, specifically non-native cool season grasses like fescue. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Yeah, so I think kind of the first thing um, to to kind of look at things from a broad picture is, you know, again, we'll, we'll get into the specifics of why this is a good time and what you can do exactly and everything else here in a minute. But I think just just taking things from a broad picture, a lot of people have this mindset that in order to get the right vegetation in a spot, you have to plant something there. And for a long time, and still within the, I think professionally, a lot of people have gotten better that are, you know, people that are professional biologists, but there's still a lot of people out there that recommend, you know, okay, go in, you know, if you want to have native warm season grass, you should go in and, you know, plant a bunch of stuff like switch grass or big blue stem or, you know, Indian grass and plant these mixtures. And for the longest time, people were just planting these mixtures of grass and they still are to a large extent. And yeah. while those different grasses can provide cover and, you know, some, some, uh, specifically thermal cover during the winter, you know, and it may be some level of bedding covered throughout the year. Grass is not really where it's at from a deer's perspective. And so, and on top of that, you know, I don't know if you've looked at a bag of native warm season grass seed, but it's pretty expensive. Oh Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very expensive, and, and so, uh, um, I you know, and and I, maybe this is what you're getting at a little bit, but even even planted mixtures have evolved a lot over the last ten or fifteen years. I mean, fifteen or twenty years ago, and I, I guess this is what you were saying, but they was they would you know they were planting very heavy rates of 
tall native warm season grasses. So Indian grass, big blue stem, um, little blue stem, and they were planting at very high rates, rates, uh, basically rates that you would plant for forage production for grazing cattle or for hay, you know, very dense stands, not necessarily what you want for wildlife. And it was just solid grass. And then, and I've seen some of these sites that, you know, were planted with that and uh, the grass only gets thicker with time and it gets so thick that even the native warm season grasses, they're not providing any benefit, at least, at least to your, you know, ground nesting birds like, uh, you know, Northern Bob white and Turkey because there's no cover underneath because this heavy, you know, dense thatch layer that it builds up from being so dense. And yeah, it might be beneficial to some, um, songbirds that nest, you know, higher up in the grass, but it was just so dense. And even from a deer's perspective, it doesn't have to be that dense. And now like even, the, even the planted mixtures now, you know, people have gotten a lot better about reducing the seed, uh, you know, reducing the amount of native warm season grass seed in it. And then they're also incorporating some forbs as well. Uh, and a lot of that's kind of toward the, the pollinator mixtures. Um, but there's, you know, I think, I think even the, even the plantings are headed in the right direction, but I like, I like where you're headed with this, that, you know, planting isn't even necessary most of the time. Yeah. And especially the one instance where I think planting may be necessary depending on, or depending on what's there is in a in a crop field that's been sprayed and cropped continuously for you know a long time yeah you may end up needing to plant something there maybe but not always and i mean i would still say there's going to be a fair amount of the time that you don't but particularly when you're dealing with a spot that is dominated by cool season grasses like fescue and this is kind of where we're going with this you don't need to necessarily plant anything and you probably shouldn't plant anything, at least not for a while until you get your grasses under control because who knows what's going to be there whenever you spray it. If you go in and spray that grass and plant something immediately, you know, plant a warm season, native warm season grass mixture, even if it's mixed with forbs and such, who knows what you're going to get back. And you may not be able to control that if you, if you go ahead and plant it immediately. So it almost in any instance, certainly, I'm recommending, you know, I, I, I would much prefer to have it sprayed and then can maybe consider planting a few years down the road. But it's incredible what you can get if you just go in and spray grass. You know, you have this area that's producing no forage, no cover for deer or, you know, most other critters that we're interested in. When you go in and spray it, and suddenly, I mean, the first year after you spray it, in most instances, you're going to get a flush of, um, especially ragweed is a really common one, but you know, you may get some other ones. You may get like some foxtail in there and, um, you know, some other stuff that may not be as beneficial, but it's not really hurting you like burn weed, but you know, you get a lot of stuff like ragweed and then, you know, two, three years down the road, you're going to get a ton of really beneficial forage plants along with those native grasses that are going to come in naturally yeah and so long story short i i just don't i don't understand why that we still have this this mindset that we have to plant stuff all the time and it, and it still you know persists to today um especially with a lot of habitat consultants and stuff that recommend it but you know regardless now is the time to be thinking about if you have an area that is covered in fescue to go in and convert that to a native plant community. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about why planning might not be necessary. And, and I think we can, I think we should, uh, touch on that a little bit more actually, you know, toward the end after we've talked about killing fescue. But before we get to that, let's let's take it back a step let's take it back two two steps let's let's talk about why we don't want fescue fescue to start with so um uh well and and i don't want to pick on just fescue there's a lot there's a lot of villains out there so um so for instance a lot of grass species and i'm and we're just talking cool season grasses today so we're not going to talk bermuda grass and and vases and some of the other evil ones but just for cool season grasses you know your biggest culprits is going to be 
fescue, um, brome, lots of different, there's several different species of brome, orchard grass, timothy. These are all, you know, heavily planted cool season grass. Oh, I I forgot ryegrass. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, oh, yeah. The good is in not good, like evil, evil, bad, non-native plant. But these are all plants, <clears throat> all cool season grasses that we brought, I should say Europeans brought, uh, primarily Europeans brought to the new world to plant as forages for cattle because we do have native cool season grasses but they're not they're not as thin thick and um not as high you know forage production as these non-native so we've brought all these grasses over and none of them are native none of them are supposed to be here and so when you put something that isn't supposed to be here on the landscape and this goes for any plant or even animal. When you put it on the landscape, it's displacing something. And I think that's what, you know, people need to think about that. Because a lot of guys will be like, oh, well, it's not hurting. And, you know, I don't, I don't want that to be a food plot or whatever. Oh, heck, some people say, oh, I don't want to see deer there. You know, I don't want to spook deer walking in. But look at it a different way. The, the cool season grass, you know, the fescue, the, the orchard grass, whatever it is you have in that back, you know, little lot that you don't mow and you bush hog once a year, whatever it is, it's displacing a beneficial native plant. That native plant might be, you know, a native warm season grass. It could be a forb. Heck, it could be a tree. But whatever it is, like, it's displacing it. So while, you know, cool season grass is aren't necessarily it's not like they're out you know poisoning deer because deer don't eat them to start with what they're doing is they're displacing what would what would otherwise be a beneficial space you know that could be actually uh, providing nutrition for various wildlife species and so you you know and 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 with especially and, and what makes cool season grasses so bad is that while they're not providing food they're displacing natives the worst thing about them is they provide absolutely no beneficial cover because they grow thick, super low to the ground, and they create this really dense thatch that turkey poults can't move through efficiently. And bobwhite, you know, northern bobwhites definitely can't move through them. So all you know, all you really have living in is insects and maybe some small mammals like um, mice, but there's no cover value to it. Because, you know, maybe a turkey pole, you know, a flock of turkeys is walking across the fescue field. Well, they're easy pickings for any uh, raptor that, you know, wants an easy meal. And the same goes for northern bobwhite. So, um, you, know, you know, that's just, th- th- those are the primary reasons that cool season grasses are evil and no one should tolerate them. And I'm on my soapbox ranting now, so I'm going to turn <laughs> it over to you, Mark. But well. <laughs> And I think one of the things that we want to emphasize with this, and and this is one of the things that I think comes up a lot with this odd area management or, you know, with this grass management is that a lot of the time it is, you know, odd area management. It is management of these small little patches. I mean, yeah, if you have cows and you have to have cattle forage, then while there are some alternatives, realistically, yeah, like in most parts of the country, at least, you know, in the mid south you know in a lot of the country non native cool season grasses are going to be some component of that cattle forage and that kind of is what it is like there's there's not much you can do about it and we're not trying to say that that you know should necessarily be your goal to change that although there again there are some alternatives you should look into but we're not getting into that today we're just talking direct just just habitat stuff with that being said yeah no. There are like, what were you saying? I was I was just gonna say, um, you know, I like that because I, I and I think it's worth mentioning because you you know it, it, as much as we would all love to one hundred percent manage for wildlife, it's realistically on most properties it isn't a possibility. And so these odd areas that you're talking about, it might be the little you know strip of brush in between the fence line and your wood line, you know, might be 10 yards wide by, you know, a quarter mile long. And it's just a little strip with some fescue in it. Like it's a prime, definitely prime area. 
Yeah, and that and that's the thing. You know, we're not necessarily talking about converting these big pastures or whatever. Although, again, I mean that that is what we're doing on our family farm, and um, you know, but we have a little bit different objectives. But if you're gonna keep cattle, and cattle are a part of what you do, then that then that's a little different story. But almost every single property that I go on has areas, you know, if it has any open area, it has little patches here and there that are, that are dominated by fescue. And it's one of those deals, you know, if you're willing to plant a half acre food plot, why would you not be willing to spray a half acre of fescue and convert it into good native forage? And even if it's not a half acre in one spot, but it's a half acre broken up into four different spots. I mean, what's the difference? And and a lot of the time to make matters worse, it's not that these spots are ignored. It's not like, oh, well, I'm just not going to do anything with that. To make matters worse, a lot of the time these spots are mowed every year, which makes the fescue worse, first off. And, and again, we keep saying fescue, but we're really referring to any cool, non-native cool season grass. Fescue is just the most persistent one and the <laughs> one that I deal with the most, which is why I keep saying it. But, you know, it's something that we're constantly dealing with and it's something you constantly see as these people with little strips here and there that they mow, whereas they could spray it and cut the amount of time that they have to worry about it in the future into thirds or so. You know, if you, if you, if they disturb it every three years or so, you know, they could cut their time. They deal with that little patch into thirds and that, that would really benefit them. So long story short, this is a very low cost, and it, it realistically on most properties, it's not going to cost you any money. It's not like, oh, well, I'm cutting some trees down and making less money from the timber from that spot because I'm carrying less trees or, oh, I'm taking cows out of the pasture. You know, there's no indirect cost to it that you're you're not paying, you know, money indirectly like, oh, we're losing future income from these areas and even better it's not costing you very much directly. Like, yeah, you got to pay for some herbicide, but compared to the amount of time and money that goes into a lot of the other things that we do management wide, hint, hint food plots, yeah. <laughs> nothing wrong with food plots, but let's be realistic. Like you're going to spray a food plot anyway. Literally all you have to do with this is spray it once. And I mean, you can't really forget about it, but if you spray it once and walk away, it's a heck of a lot better than it was before. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the point that we're trying to get at with this, or I'm trying to get at here, is that this is just such an easy thing. Any property, just think about your property. Think about the little patches that are here and there of non-native cool season grass. And then over the coming weeks, get out and spray it. And I, I guess we should talk a little bit about how to actually, you know, the <laughs> preferred methods for getting rid of it. Yeah. But, you know, every <clears throat> property has little patches here and there. You know, if it's, again, some if you get far enough south, it's probably going to be non-native warm season grass, which we can talk about at a later date. But this being the time of year that it is, these little patches, this is prime time to deal with them. Absolutely prime time to deal with them. It is. I mean, in, in on, you know, just a weekend, maybe you're hunting or whatever. It doesn't, it's not one of those things that has to take all day. Like, you can easily load up you know, 50 gallons of herbicide mix and spray it, you know, in an hour or two, and then you're done with it and you just run over it and spray it depending on whatever equipment you have. Uh, and then you're done with it. And like you're saying, that's it. Like you just walk away and then you're going to come back next year and, and probably have to spot spray some stuff. But it's so like the time investment is so minimal and the return is so great. And I think that's why so many people underestimate it is because it, like the mentality is in, in, you know, this is in general, especially with food plots, the whole kind of like big buck on the bag, the more expensive the seed, the better it is, the bigger the deer and all that, da, 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 all that. The mentality is the more work you put into it, the more you get out of it. And generally in life, that's how things are. But like something like this, people underestimate because it's so easy, but it's really incredible what can happen when you just allow the native, you know, seed bank to respond and, and by doing, the, you know, by killing the, the invader, the invasive grass, it's amazing what will respond. And like one great little example is like my family where we live, we have a huge yard. And so it wasn't, you know, any hurdle at all to convince my dad to convert 
a quarter acre or so of the backyard um, that he didn't want to mow a big area into native forbs and grasses. And so I went in there and I sprayed the fescue and the Bermuda grass. And now the deer, like there's evidence of deer browse up to like 15 yards from the house on ragweed and other plants. And, uh, I guarantee you the, even, you know, even though I'm not going to hunt in the backyard, I guarantee you the little strip of woods on the edge of the yard is, a, will be a lot better for deer hunting than it was when it was, you know, a mowed yard right up to it. So it almost is kind of creating this buffer of good food and cover that is going to just kind of make the deer feel even more comfortable right along that edge of the yard, you know, in the woods or if I even hunted it. But, you know, you you get my point. Like, it, it's just incredible how much uh, just a little afternoon, an hour here or there can do. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess kind of going, going forward with this, Mariah, if you've got a an area that is dominated by fescue, what uh what are you gonna do what are you gonna do with it right now and you want to convert it assuming obviously that oh, you, you didn't have to tell me that i already want to convert it <laughs> <laughs> well assuming you have the ability to convert it what are you gonna do with it how are, how are you gonna shift it to a native plant community the ability and knowledge to want to convert it um yeah so let's see today it's october 9th so if i was at home if I was at home, the first frost is usually around the 20th of October. So I would be preparing to, I would, I would plan to spray at the end of October. And a uh, couple reasons for that. Uh, first of all, fescue right now is, be, you know, in fall is, be, is preparing to become dormant. Uh, it is a cool season grass, so it is most active now. You know, it's growing vigorously right now. And it's eventually going to become dormant in winter, but you get a lot, you know, you get, you can get a really good kill right now when it's producing a lot of uh, energy through photosynthesis uh, in its blade, you know, in its, its leaves. And it's, all, it's pulling all the energy down into its root system. So if you can spray it right now before winter, it's going to pull in the glyphosate or any herbicide we use into the roots. So I'm going to shoot for the end of October when... A lot of our perennial forbs are, well, and even, to be fair, perennial grasses are dormant. So broom sedge and pokeweed and others, they're dormant. At this point, our annuals, like ragweed and partridge pea and some of the other really good plants, are all, you know, they've already set seed. And so that seed is on the ground <clears throat> and... So that's really not a concern. But anyway, yeah, I'm going to wait till probably the end of October. I'm going to wait until the first decent frost, and then I'm going to spray that whole area with glyphosate at two quarts to the acre. And, you know, I can do that super cheap. Like, I can go to the store, and I can buy two and a half gallons of glyphosate for 30 or 40 bucks, like depending on what kind of deal I get. But most of the time, you can get two and a half gallons for 40 bucks. You do the math. I mean, that's that's pretty cheap per an acre treatment because all all I'm mixing is just that glyphosate and water, and I'll spray it, and it's yeah, it's gonna turn all brown. Um, and then what I may do come you know late winter, maybe February or March, is I'll go ahead and I'll burn that just to to burn off the thatch, and uh, and I'll probably just leave it. You know, I could disc it if I wanted, and. Uh, I could, you know, I could burn it and then disc it, and that would definitely promote a lot of ragweed and some annual plants, uh, which could be beneficial. And depending on the landscape, depending on if you know, I'm trying to encourage a lot of annuals, uh, if I'm wanting a lot of brood cover for turkey, especially, you know, then I would want a good annual plant community. If I'm just worried about you know converting it into cover, I probably just leave it burn it and then leave it and you're going to get a mix of annuals and then whatever perennials are all are already there um yeah so that that would be my plan of attack mark uh would you do anything differently no i don't think so um you know i might consider the one thing that you didn't mention depending on what the area looks like i might consider mowing it ahead of time 
but like you know a few weeks at a time not or, or about a month at a time really not not just beforehand but you know a lot of the time i don't think that's necessary at least i haven't really saw the need to do that as long as the fescue is not super super tall i mean and typically typically if it's mowed if it's been mowed at some point during the summer then it's not not going to be all that in all that bad of shape so so that's not always a necessary treatment um, the other thing I'll mention is, you know, a lot of areas that you see, and Mar- Mariah kind of mentioned this earlier, a lot of areas that you see may have, you know, they may have some good stuff. A lot of time they'll have like some blackberry growing up and maybe some scattered broom sedge or, you know, whatever. They've got some good native plants in there, but then there's a, underneath all that, there's a bunch of fescue. Well, those areas are super easy to convert because you can literally do this exact same treatment. Even though we're using Roundup or glyphosate, because those plants are dormant, they're not taking up the herbicide. And so we have an opportunity here to convert these areas with the exact same herbicide regardless, which is part of the reason why this is this is such a good option is because it's so simple to explain to people. I mean, you literally just go out and spray herbicide on it, um, spray a very the most commonly available herbicide on the plant and regardless of really the condition the stands in or anything like that, you're going to have some good results from it. Yeah, that's true. Super easy and great, uh, great result. Um, yeah, especially on the, the mowing you were talking about in like in old, old overgrown fields, maybe, you know, uh, old cattle pasture that hasn't been mowed and, or hasn't been grazed in two or three years. I've noticed a lot of times in, in those areas, and they're usually the the plant communities are already, you know, they're getting that blackberry and they're getting some woody cover in there or, or shrubby cover. A lot of those, there'll be so much thatch built up and uh, of the fescue. And, and, you know, in some cases it may even be, you know, beneficial forbs that are, you know, they're they're becoming dormant now, but there's still so much, you know, thatch or old growth left of them and old leaves that it blocks your treatment to your, to the growing leaves of the fescue. So like Mark said, mowing can be super beneficial because what it's doing is it's removing all of the, the plant matter above the growing tissue of the plants so that that growing plant part can be exposed to the herbicide. And then also, you know, after you mow it, that, cool season grass is going to be stimulated to green up again. It's going to start growing right away. And that's pretty much going to be what's growing. It's going to be, you know, producing a a, a ton of biomass trying to, to replace, you know, what was cut off and it's going to pull in all that herbicide. So it's perfect. Yeah. And, and I just, I just think that's an important note. And again, that's not always necessary to do. It just kind of depends on the condition of the stand, but man it's just it's it's one of those things that it pains me to see i mean obviously i I hate seeing non-native pasture and field and whatever but especially on a property there's just so many dang hunting properties that have areas that are covered in it and it's like what are you doing with this area oh we just mow it every once in a while well why not make it better i mean we got to break this mindset of thinking that, you know, well, we just got to keep it clean. And I I think that's part of the issue is people thinking, oh, we got to keep it clean because for so many species, that's just not, I mean, that's not what we need at all. Yeah. And and yeah, I mean, obviously our focus is game species, but you know, one example that I'll share, we had a, we had an area that, um, part of which is the dove field that, um, we have our annual dove hunt in that, four years ago was a fescue pasture. We went in and sprayed it. And this, I think like within the second season or so after we, we sprayed it, there started to grow a couple patches of milkweed out there. And one of them is really booming along now. And there's all sorts of, um, just, all sorts of butterflies monarchs in there this year and it's pretty cool and and yeah i'm not trying to manage for butterflies or anything like that obviously the area in general is producing way more deer forage and cover for turkeys and quail and rabbits than it was before 
But it's kind of cool on top of all that to know that, yeah, that one herbicide application, which I will note, and, and this is kind of an aside, but I will note, you know, glyphosate's kind of the herbicide that people get onto when it comes to, you know, how the monarchs are declining. And, uh, uh, and obviously, yeah, there are some, there are some issues and clearly the coverage of milkweed across the landscape is declining largely, or at least partially due to the fact that we've got, you know, uh, roundup ready cropping systems and just cleaner farming in general. But it's kind of ironic that I use that same tool and it kind of reminds me of, you know, I don't know if you remember in Sand County Almanac, how Otto Leopold, he talks about how that the same tools that have been used to destroy the land can also be used to help it or, you know, the wording, something like that. It's like we're using the same tool that has probably largely hurt monarchs to help them in this case. Now, again, that's that's just a little example, but I, I just stuff like that kind of makes me excited as a wildlife manager, just knowing that my decisions are having bigger impacts. And especially whenever you think about, like, would I rather have this little mode patch of fescue or some butterflies and deer food <laughs> and, you know, cover for quail and turkey and a bunch of songbirds and everything else in the world that you could ever ask for? I love it. I mean, that just, it blows my mind that people don't, people are not, I mean, it's just, it's just not flashy enough. And I think that's part of the problem with it. But yeah, I, you know, if people, if, I love it. If people were willing to devote those, like changing those two to, you know, almost every property has like two or 3% in just these little areas, these little patches that they could convert. And it's like, if they would just, if people would just devote to doing that, like uh, it would make things a lot better for them. And, um, you know, and I think, I think it could even have some, you know, larger conservation impacts. I mean, obviously it's not going to be the same as changing the whole landscape over, but surely isn't going to hurt anyone for sure. And, you know, and, and getting back to our, our first point, um, kind of about the planted mixtures, I kind of, since we, we have a couple minutes here, I'd, I'd love to just kind of roll over a couple of, you know, just a few super prominent common species and uh you know that are available in probably about everybody's seed bank and their benefits you know wildlife benefits yeah how's that sound absolutely okay. i think that i think that'd be great yeah let's uh let's start first with broom sedge like we see this stuff everywhere you know if you're driving down the highway and you see the the especially in winter the clumps of tall brown grass it just looks like an old uh, kind of like an old broom you know like straw um you'll see growing along the edge of highways that's broom sedge um and it's a native warm season grass and you know while it isn't providing any forage what it does provide is structure and cover and especially like for bob white quail i mean w when they nest well first of all they they need cover um you know to avoid being predated but they also need cover um for nesting and they'll a lot of times use the bases of broom sedge they'll nest right at the base of broom sedge um, broom sedge is also a super important component of you know old old field habitat like old field plant communities um because it provides a uh, structure that stays all winter it doesn't like a windstorm won't blow it over well i got news for you <laughs> and, and you know this mark but for everyone else out there like if you have a nice beautiful planting of indian grass or big blue stem the first snowstorm or heavy wind that blows through it's all going to be laying over um it doesn't stand tall yeah, through it, winter it, it just it lodges and falls over and then it's a thatch and for some reason, people think that deer need this super tall cover to bed down in. No. I don't know where that idea got started, but it's just it's just not the case. I mean, deer are not that tall. I think that's one thing. People overestimate how tall deer, deer are. No, yeah, yeah. But uh, on top of that, I mean, when they lay down, what more could they ask for than a, a field that's going to be, you know, I mean, any any field of broom sedge is going to be taller than their heads. Yeah. I mean, uh, anything above that, it's just overkill to where they can't see or hear anything going on. Right, yeah. I just, I, I've never understood that. But yeah, I mean, broom sedge is, is good, 
good to your bedding cover. I mean, yeah, certainly there there could be some benefits to having some other plants in there to break it up, but I don't think that deer are that much more likely to bed in a field of switchgrass versus a field of broom sedge. Yeah, because, I mean, your average broom sedge is probably three or four feet tall, and when a deer is bedded, its head is, you know, it's probably 18 inches off the ground, um, depending on what position, yep. you know, it's in. So, I mean, that's down below, and... And heck, you know, I've been a lot of the times, and we can't get inside a deer's head, so this is, we can sit here and we'll, we can talk about this forever, but, you know, I bet I bet deer like to bed in something where they can see through or over it if they want to, versus sitting in a, you know, a dense mat, and sometimes they do want, you know, something that's super dense and they can disappear in, but like, I bet you, I bet you they really do like bedding in, you know, these plant communities that are three or four feet tall because if they want to stand up, you know, if they hear something, they can stand up and check it out or they can lay down and completely disappear. Exactly. No, I, I completely agree. And I, like I say, that's kind of, that's kind of what I think about it too. I mean, at the very least, yeah. Broom sedge, broom sedge is probably your one that's going to respond most often um, as far as grass wise. And there's nothing wrong with it. People kind of look down on it at times, but you know, there's nothing wrong with it. And it's it. perennial, so it will come back every year. You know, you'll get those bunches every yep. year. So, yeah, all right, you get the you get to pick the next one. Let's do another another fun common plant. Uh, are we just doing grasses or are we no, doing man? Anything? Anything? We'll just we'll do like four or five. Just you know what what everybody's right. going to get when they kill fescue. What what's going to come up? Okay, well, I'll do my favorite, which is going to be common ragweed. Um, again, this is a super, super, super common plant, and some people regard it as a weed, but in my opinion, it's going to be one of the top wildlife plants out Well, not in my opinion. It is one of the most beneficial wildlife plants, especially for most of your game species. Um, you know, it's great deer forage, and it's pretty decent deer cover. I mean, especially during the summertime, I mean, it, you know... I've had a lot of ragweed patches that get five foot tall or so by the end of summer. So, I mean, it's not, it's not a bad cover component for deer, but really the biggest thing with deer is forage. It's a really, really highly selected deer forage. It's really high quality and it's just a great option for deer food during the, during the summertime. And so that, that goes without saying. Yeah. The other things that it's good for are turkey and quail. And for, for quail, it's a really good food plant. I just keep saying it's really good. I'm, I'm repeating myself, but (laughs) you're in love. (laughs) It's a high quality food plant. Yeah, basically it's a high quality food plant for quail, the seeds, but really the thing about ragweed that makes it so special for quail and Turkey is the structure that it provides. It provides that good overhead cover while only having, you know, little stalks going up to that point. And it's, it's the perfect brooding cover. Um, little quail poults or turkey quail chicks or turkey poults I about mix that up can get up under there and move around without being impeded by a bunch of thick vegetation and typically ragweed's going to respond the first year and it's really the one that i think about that pops in my mind as far as you went from tall fescue dominated to ragweed dominated and, and in a lot of sites that's what you get especially if you run a disc over it i mean you can't ask for better than that and the one thing, again, kind of going back to, or going on that route, um, if you do want to have a lot of coverage of ragweed on most sites, if you were on a disc over it after you kill the fescue, sometime between, let's just say, January and February and even into March, if you're a little further north, you're going to get a pretty good coverage of ragweed on many sites. I'm not going to say everywhere, but on a lot of sites, uh, that's that's what you're going to be dominated by. Yeah. And for the the deer from the deer forest perspective, um can have up to 30% crude protein, you know, in the forage which you know that's way more than the deer ever needs, um first of all, and will rival any food plot planting and it doesn't cost you or I a penny to put it out there on the on the landscape. So, it's definitely a win-win. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, what's your next I'm one? I'm going to combine two because I forget when it was, right. with, what was it? The gear that we will never buy again. You combine two at the end. So I'm, I'm throwing that 
that yeah. curveball back All in. Right, go for it. Um, two that are very similar. Um, one that's really common, and one that maybe is a little less common. Um, but you know, we were talking about having really tall cover. Uh, for those for people that really want that, uh, one that everyone's going to know is goldenrod. Um, goldenrod is perennial, and then there's another plant, uh, actually another genus of plants so there's several different species that are all very similar um the wing stem plants and uh they're also perennials and both of these you know they're they they form these dense stands you know like goldenrod has rhizomes that have the underground stems that uh you know they reproduce just by shooting up another plant next to it and so you get these really dense patches of them um, but you know, goldenrod will, can easily be six, seven feet tall. Commonly I've seen it even taller and then wing stem on average is around the same height, but I've seen it over 10 feet tall, um, different species of it. And both of these plants are perennial forbs. They come back every year and while they, you know, they provide really good cut, co- you know, really tall cover, I should say. Um, good over overhead cover, like you're talking about for uh, for quail chicks and turkey poults, but um, cover for deer. And then you know, goldenrod is browsed by deer um, a little, not not a, necessarily a ton, but that but deer will browse it. But both of these, you know, kind of like what we were talking about, what we were back before. Both of these perennial plants I'm talking about are really, really good for pollinators. They have, you know, really big, showy, bright flowers. And when they're blooming, they're just covered in butterflies, in uh, honeybees, in wasps, in everything you can think of. And, uh, I, you know, I think that's pretty cool. Like, if if you can't go outside in summer and appreciate just life... You know what I mean? I, I don't want to get too cheesy here, but like, if you can't just like appreciate everything just alive and and living and you know enjoying your hard work and uh, in your habitat management, like you're really missing something. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, I I agree a hundred percent, and and that's kind of coming back full circle. It's one of those deals, you know. You have the option of either having just grass, whether it's a, you know, non-native fescue or just grass because you just decided you were going to kill the fescue and then plant switchgrass, or you can have this diverse plant community there. And so I just think, I just think it's a shame that some people choose to just leave those areas and mow them. Yeah. I, I never will understand that. Yeah, that's right. And there are hundreds more annuals and perennials and uh, woody shrubs that would all potentially come up in an area just because you killed invasive plants. And we don't, I I guess we don't have time to cover that tonight because I do need to be at work in, you know, less than 10 hours. So we, we could talk until probably tomorrow afternoon on different plants. Uh, beneficial native plants. Yep, for sure. But uh, that'll all come in due time. And right now, you don't, if you're out hunting... Don't tell people that. You'll consider... scare them. <laughs> They'll come in due time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's the thing. You know, if, if you're out hunting or whatever, while you're sitting in the stand, take a break and, and think about some areas that you've got that are not really being being used to their full potential for a lot of wildlife species right now and um, consider making a change. And, you know, everybody's got time sitting in the stand that uh, or in the middle of the day this time of year that they're not out in the woods. So consider, consider making that change happen. Yeah. And I guess next, probably wait till next summer, we'll take on warm season, uh, non-native warm season grasses. Yep. Yeah, that sounds like a plan. Yeah, definitely plenty of material. Unfortunately, there's plenty of <laughs> non-natives that need to be killed, so we'll get to that when we get to that. But it's lots of potential. Just think about it like that. Oh yeah, there's plenty of potential and, you know, there's 
people in the world that are working to give us even more potential because there's still new invasives popping up now. So, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, yeah. Um, you got anything else you want to say or add or anything? I think that's about it. Yeah. I hear you. You got, uh, what is it, six days till deer season starts? I'm ready. Hey. Um, so Are ready. you going to hunt that first day, do you think? Or will you be able to? I think I'm, I think I'm going to be able to hunt the first day. I, I'm going to at least, I'm going to hunt the evening, I think. Yeah. So, I'll get out I've, there. I've definitely kind of hit it really hard this first week just because I'm a little, I've been a little bit stand deprived. Um, but I think it's probably going to slow down a little bit as far as time that I'll be able to get out, but I'm, uh, I'm looking forward. I, I really, I, and I really mean this. I really want to hear a story next time about you at least seeing or shooting a big deer, like, or just having, having a good hunt. Um, cause it's, it's already like, well, I guess we can't record on Sunday then we got to record on Monday. <laughs> Or Tuesday. <laughs> well, maybe the next time after that. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Maybe I'll do it. <laughs> exactly. Maybe I'll have a good hunt with a big deer. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it. No, you can't. Well, you can do that, but you can't take away that. <laughs> I got to have a big one eventually. Sooner or later. Eventually. <laughs> well, well, you've shot two bucks since I, I've shot a buck. So, you know, it all evens out. Because I, ne- I didn't shoot one last year. Just get you a little button buck and just whack it. Oh, I, I will say this: I both of the bucks that I've passed so far, the like two year old bucks, uh, have had a lot of people tell me that I should be shooting them. So I don't know. We'll t- take it for what's yeah. worth. But that one tonight wasn't. He didn't look too bad from the video. No, in the video he actually looked smaller. He like when I first saw him, I got excited for a second. He had pretty long main beams. Like he was just a big fork with. He had probably like three inch brow tines, like decent bases. Like I, I, I'm guessing he was a two year old. You know, I never saw his body, but I really feel I feel pretty good that he was a two year old. You know, which that gets yeah. me excited. Like, you know, you see yearlings all the time, but I, I get I get excited even just seeing a deer that I'm not necessarily wanting to shoot. But hey, I outsmarted him. That's that's what you know really. That's the fun part. Absolutely. Can't wait for it, man. Yeah. Less than a week. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to have to get off here. I got to go head up to my study site the rest of the week, and I got to go plant 200 seedlings, and then I need to start picking up acorns for an experiment. I have 60,000 I need to pick up over the next month. So... (laughs) <laughs> we'll see <laughs> i may not be alive gotta, gotta start fighting the squirrels oh yeah i'm I'm going i'm like putting on the full armor and uh <laughs> leather gloves and <laughs> i'm going in gotta take them on which one other thing and then i'll hop off here but i, I uh the other day i saw a gray squirrel with a white like the end of his tail was white it's pretty cool yeah hmm. dang yeah I saw I saw a funky looking one last year too. Really? I don't remember what happened. It was on that oxbow. I don't remember what it was about it. It had like a lot of white on it. I yeah. Think. Well, there's, like I said, it's some of the cool things you see outside. You just have to kind of take a second to appreciate it, and you know. And sometimes I struggle with that. You know, it's like you're trying to you have this goal of you know something you want to harvest, or you know, so often. So often it's just kind of hard to miss, or it's so easy to miss, you know, some of the the small stuff. Um, Even the stupid armadillos crawling under you. Like, (laughs) sometimes you just have to appreciate just being outside, even if you're not shooting something. All right, well, uh, we'll uh, we'll hop off here. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you haven't yet, you can check out our Facebook page, Hunt the Land Podcast, and then also our Instagram, which is huntingtheland.com. Or hunting the land, sorry. Our website is huntingtheland.com. So, anyway, we will see you all again next week, and thank you for listening. <laughs>